Welcome, everybody. Um, this is a, uh, an event um, on uh, a wonderful book, award-winning book by our guest today, Jeffrey Haas. Um, the event is co-sponsored by the Institute for European, Russian, and Eurasian Studies and the university seminar on Europe since COVID, as well as the George Washington University Department of History. Um, Jeff is uh, really a wonderful scholar. This is not his first book, but this one is really um, timely. He, uh, Jeff earned his uh, degree at Harvard, his BA at Harvard and PhD at Princeton, and he's now professor and chair of sociology and anthropology at the University of Richmond. But he also has a part-time professorship in economics at the, the Faculty of Economics in the Department of Economic Theory at St. Petersburg State University in Russia. Uh, he has uh, authored a number of books, one, uh, Power, Culture, and Economic Change in Russia, uh, one on economic sociology, uh, another, Rethinking the Post-Soviet Experience and Reexamining the History of the Russian Economy. Um, but today we're lucky, we're lucky to hear him uh, speak about his um, most recent book, Wartime Suffering and Survival, The Human Condition Under Siege in the Blockade of Leningrad from 1941 to 44 from Oxford University Press. This book has won honorable mention from the American Sociological Association Distinguished Scholarly Book Award. He is a co-winner of Outstanding Book Prize in the section on war, peace, and social conflict. And he uh, just most recently received the Mira Komarovsky Best Book Award from the Eastern Sociological Society. Um, Jeff is gonna uh, talk about the book first, but he'll be uh, followed by a discussion with commentary from our colleague, Hope Harrison, who in addition to co-organizing the university seminar uh, on COVID, uh, sorry, on uh, Europe since COVID, and also I guess is organizing the history colloquium as well. Um, Hope is professor of history and international affairs at GW, and she's also an expert on Russia as well as Germany. She's the author of Driving the Soviets Up the Wall, a great title, uh, Soviet East German Relations 1953 to 61, and more recently, After the Berlin Wall, Memory and the Making of the New Germany from 1989 to the Present. So um, we're looking forward to your comments, but first, for all of you in the room and out there in cyberspace, I give you Jeffrey Haas. Thank you, Hillary. Um, my thanks to all of you for being here. My, my thanks to, to Hillary for the invitation, to Matt Cooley for organizing all of this, to Hope for uh, commentary afterwards. Um, and I, I hope I will do justice uh, to the invitation up here. I love coming up to DC. It's, it's, it's my pleasure and my honor. Um, the, the book is about a very tragic and brutal event. It was hard to research and it was hard to write. Um, but it was the kind of project that it seemed to me that needed to be done, not only to emancipate the voices of many people who had suffered and then suffered silence in the propaganda of the Soviet era, but also because this is an important case, not only in and of itself, but about who we are. Um, this moment of extreme duress of suffering and survival um, points out something about the human condition, about human social practices that can get eclipsed by institutions and structures in moments of stability. So we need to turn into the dark, as it were, not only to recognize the suffering of those who are there, but to learn lessons for the living and for those who will come. So this has kind of been what I've been oriented with um, in the book, there are kind of four sets of themes, questions uh, that have been driving this project. The first, who are we when our backs are against the wall, in the moments of duress, when it seems that institutions and anything else can decay at any moment? 
um, to what extent does habit persist versus cold, rational, calculated uh, strategic action? To what extent do people innovate? And to what extent do they rely on what they know? Change versus continuity. What kind of variation do we see um, in, in struggling and survival? And I suppose in the end, was uh, Primo Levi right when he talked about the law of the lager in the death camps? That is, eat your own food and that of others if you can. Or is there something social? Is there some kind of solidarity that can persist? Another set of themes is um, emancipating Leningrader's voices and, and, and seeing what is it that they're saying about the experience of suffering. Um, do they suffer and try to survive individually, socially? Um, how do they identify themselves as atomized individuals at the limit of fate? Um, or are there social relations that still matter? And if so, why? The third set of questions is about collapse and resilience. Um, and there's a really wonderful group at Princeton that's, that's looking into this, <laughs> timely given COVID and everything else. Um, what is the human capacity to adapt? How is it that we're able to persist when it seems the sledgehammer of fate or politics or war um, can slam institutions, break them apart at any moment? Um, and a fourth war historiographical issue is what does war do to Bolshevism? I think we still know too little about this. Um, was it possible, for example, that Bolshevism could possibly um, shift from theocracy to a more pragmatic authoritarianism, as one example? Because the question of could Bolshevism ever innovate or change remains an unanswered question. So these are some of the things the book tries to address and um, the blockade is the case for it. And just, I, I'm sure you all know what the blockade is just to kind of get us into the, into the context. This was 872 days of hell. It was um, uncertainty, violence from above in German artillery or air raids, um, but the scarcity of material resources and especially food um, were probably the greatest threat of all. And it's the scarcity of food that is really at the center of the blockade experience. Because this is what compels people to shift their calculus of cost-benefit calculations. It is one thing to obey the law, to obey norms, to live on your rations, but if rations are not enough for survival, obedience can mean death. Breaking the rules might be the only way to survive, even if one does not want to break them. So the scarcity, this extreme scarcity of food compels what I, I call tragic agency and opportunism in order to survive. Um, and just an idea of, as we sit here over lunch, just to give you an idea of, of, of how bad this was in November and December of 1941, uh, the bread ration hit its nadir, 250 grams for military industrial workers, 125 grams for everyone else. That is a half and a fourth of a loaf of American bread um, with less nutrient value. This, these were starvation rations. At the same time, the state, which usually keeps order, at least in modernity, was suffering from institutional compromise and bureaucratic failure. Um, bureaucratic you know, cadres in the state and in the party did not have the right set of skills for dealing with war. They could deal with Stalinist five-year plans, but not with this. Um, bureaucrats, police, lower level NKVD agents were starving along with civilians. This was a constantly changing situation and there was lower level opportunism within the state. Um, for example, those uh, cadres who were in charge of food, whether in stores, bakeries, depots, um, would quite often steal some of that food to consume or sell in the black market, reducing the state's capacity not only to defend its civilians, but also reducing this dependency power and therefore institutional force that the state itself had. So th if the threat of revolution which happened in 1917 in the same city, by the way. If the threat of revolution might not have been real, the threat of institutional decay certainly was. Hobbes might be getting his revenge here, but it didn't happen. Why not? Now, in telling the story, there's you know, three parts to the book. You know, this is the book in a minute and a half. Um, part one looks at uh, structures and relations at the macro level, those of the state, and at the micro level, those of small communities, families, um, friendship groups. Um, and exploring not only the threats uh, to, to any in structural integrity, but the compromises made to maintain some degree of resilience. Um, in one case, uh, the state negotiating with and coming to a compromise of sorts with insider opportunists and a shadow or black market of food. Which, again, it compromises state power, but somehow keeps things alive. Um, at the micro level, how it is that families that are under incredible stress 
and the incentive to steal fruit from each other, how they managed to hold together. Um, part two looks at inequality because survival was unequal, especially across uh, class and gender. I'll talk a little bit about gender today, but it turns out inequality could provide not only uneven suffering, but also could provide tools for survival. And in, the, in doing so could also reinforce um, the sense that inequality was eternal, natural, essential. And part three looks at pain. Pain is ever present in the, in the blockade story. I'll talk a little bit about death and about the competing, sometimes contradictory approaches to coping with death. But another facet of this was theodicy, exploring, explaining suffering, which I suspect was at the beginning of the true creation of the Soviet nation. That nation building begins in part with suffering, communities of authentic suffering, a shared experience as it were. Um, now, I'm a social scientist, I have to explain it's part of our training, it's in the sociological constitution. Um, just, I'll, I'll go over this very quickly because I am trying to answer the, the question why. Leningraders told us what happened and they were crying out to understand why they were going through this. And in attempting to explain why, I'm kind of calling on three important dynamics and I'll hit them very quickly and hope they come alive in the, in the stories. First, drawing on Adam Smith, uh, drawing on some criminology, um, is that there's something about social and symbolic distance and empathy. The more visible or the closer or the more intimate knowledge we have of some other person or anything else, um, the less likely we are to be cold and rationally calculating. We see this other as something with maybe some degree of intrinsic worth. This can um, nudge, trigger, some degree of solidarity, or at least cooperation, driven less by calculation, but more by some kind of emotional sense of humanity. In contrast, some distant other that we might not know about could be a target for opportunism or coded as a threat. And just as a quick example, and this turns out to be a kind of an empirical truth in the blockade, it's easier to steal from the state, which is a bureaucratic, faceless entity, distant, than it is from those who are up close, even though you know where their food is, because they're living in, under the same roof with you. Um, but this makes it seem as if empathy and distance are kind of homogenous. That's not the case. There are other entities outside of us to which we attach um, significant personal and emotional investment. I call these, drawing on some uh, a phrase of John Martin's, anchors of valence. That is, there are these entities that anchor us into a social world and that draw our attention towards them. They become, in part, a sense of self. And I draw this from some attachment theory and psychology. Um, from economics, from Bruno Latour, and especially from Gary Becker's definition of love. Gary Becker, the arch rational choice economist. If I love someone else, it's because their well-being is part of my utility function. You'll never find that on a Hallmark card, but it leads to this idea that who I am, in fact, is intimately related to some other important entity, not just everything, but there's a texture to social relations and some things, their survival, their well-being is as important as my own. So these anchors of valence become a mediator of sorts between myself, ourselves, and the social world. The third part of the explanatory apparatus, uh, and this is drawing from uh, Pierre Bourdieu, Paul DiMaggio, John Martin, are fields and these kind of logics of practice that surround them. I'll hit this very quickly, come back to it in depth. A field is a, a social community of sorts of actors who feel a sense of affinity, even if they're across institutions. They share this sense of rules of practice, and goals towards which they are oriented. John Martin has called this a community of organized striving. And there are three important fields in Leningrad, uh, important for the story. The first, fields of power. This is the upper reaches of the hierarchies of the state and the communist party, where the logic of practice is a political economy of control. Order, discipline, control, exploitation are key to decision-making in this field. A second field, fields of labor, those who implement orders from above. The logic here is what I call a market economy of gain. This sounds odd for a socialist Stalinist society, but especially after the 30s, when Stalinist policies were those of atomization, repression, exploitation for non-elites on the job, survival or at least autonomy was individualized. The way that one survived was taking advantage of the shadows as a way of resisting, maybe stealing from one's job as a way of getting extra food or extra income. That is survival and autonomy or agency required turning into something like homo economicus, ironically, for a socialist system. 
And Don Filser and other labor historians have commented on this. Um, and I, I draw on them as a kind of template for this. The third field is a field, I call a field of intimacy and community with a moral economy of dignity. These are close emotional communities, families, friendship groups, kith and kin, where others have some degree of intrinsic value, where emotions are at least as important, if not more important than calculation. This is not a field of control as much as it is a field of Gemeinschaft, as Durkheim called it, of community. These will come into conflict. I'll talk about this a little bit more when I get to death, where this will become very important. How do these come together? There's something about social distance that can encourage whether or not we feel solidarity and cooperation or approach something as a threat or something, a uh, target of opportunism. Some of these entities will have more salience than others, and they will draw our attention when making decisions. But how we make these decisions, how we perceive these anchors of valence will, de will be determined in part by the field we are in at the moment we make this decision. All of these things come together. Now, and this is kind of the key to resilience and survival, how these three interact. To show this, let me talk about gender and then about death as, as two um, experiences of the blockade. Gender. Um, this is a feminized city. Early in 1942, 75% um, of the population, roughly, are women. Um, they are manning the factories. They are making sure that everyone in the home is surviving. They are manning the bureaucracies. Not only is the city feminized, it is women keeping the city alive. As powerful as a story this is, it, it has not received near enough attention in any of the historical scholarship in Russian or in other languages. And no one has taken a deep dive into it, unfortunately. This raises a question, what is it that's driving women to really stand up and put in incredible superhuman effort um, to aid the survival, not just of themselves, but of the city? So a few things that are going on here. The first is pre-war social, socialization of women in a gendered patriarchal society where women are socialized to expect that they will have the lower status, lesser paying jobs, and they will also have to do the second shift. Um, those of you who have seen this in sociology of gender, the first shift is the job, the second shift is domestic labor, which has fallen on women consistently even till today. Um, and socialization of the into the second shift, and following the example of other generations and in, in the home, um, imparts a particular gendered habitus, gendered habits. Um, including two particular sets of practices and skills, those of caregiving, providing care to others, and what I call bread seeking. Bread winning is the male bringing home the money. Bread seeking is using that money to find deficit goods like food or anything else, and then to use it economically. What is important is in peacetime, this relegates women to secondary status. But in a moment of duress, when there's very little food, these are the skills you need to survive. There is this ironic flip in the perceived value of labor. To put it bluntly, women go from being servants to saviors. And this will be part of the story in a second. But also as part of this gendered socialization, what Simone de Beauvoir noticed in the West is going on here as well, the sense of women and other. That women are taught, socialized to understand that they only fulfill their sense of being in relation to orienting themselves towards others, mates, children, parents, and so on. For men, it's the other way around. The vector is all of these other entities I have to pay attention to me. What this is doing is this is creating particular others within families as anchors of valence. Women are essentially being socialized to realize themselves and to pay close attention to these close other individuals. Um, so not only do they know how to, women know how to use resources um, economically, they're also, they also have a habitus which encourages them to include the well-being of others as part of their senses of self. And we can add to this as behavioral economics has shown people tend to be risk averse, which means risk to these others is a risk to myself. Therefore, when it's time to defend myself from duress, I'm going to defend these others. So relations to these anchors of valence, in this case, women to mates, children, et cetera, are going to be oriented towards reducing risk, saving them, which will lead to an interesting status shift and dynamics of gender really getting fascinating for survival. So by November 1941, hunger, starvation are starting to set in. Men succumb to, har uh, men succumb to hunger more rapidly than women do. And this is not only in Leningrad. Um, my biology colleagues told me that this tends to be the case. Men will succumb to hunger to weakness much earlier than women will. It has to do with um, 
with biological processes and um, um, metabolism and various other physiological sets. So men succumb to, to, to hunger earlier, which means they lose energy and they start to become weak. They're, they're resting in bed because they can't get up more often. So women take their places. They take their places only in factories where men have been drafted or weaker or dying, but they also are the only people left who can go out to stores, to bakeries, to get food, to go to the job, to the cafeteria, to bring back extra food. Women take this on themselves, these, these tasks of making sure that people are defended, children, husbands, brothers, fathers, defended, and they're fed. That is, the socialization from beforehand, beforehand kicks into high drive. And in their diaries, women remark, I am just doing what I need to do. And those who are conscious of this actually will comment that this is my job. This is one quote of many, but it best captures the sense of women feeling these, these tasks that they have to do. Sofia Glazinitska is um, a party official in a textile factory. And at the end of 1941, there are air raids. There's also hunger. And there's this concern that especially factory children are at risk. And she mentioned in an interview, we were told this by party officials, you women don't need to be taught what to do with children. Well, so we began to solve this problem ourselves. Important point especially given that you know, Soviet political culture is don't do anything till you're told to do it. Well, we did not adopt formal decisions in the factory party committee. We just said the quicker we created a nursery, the more of our children would remain alive. Women workers set out to work. At the same time, by the way, they are also spontaneously organizing drives to collect clothing, which they will send to, to soldiers, repairing clothing that soldiers sent back, um, and in their own families. They are going, again, to stores to bring back food which is very difficult. It's cold, minus 25 degrees centigrade when you get to January 1942, standing in long lines. This is hell. And yet women are not questioning this. They are doing it. And they're proud of how they're doing it. And there's a nice field effect. These women not only notice that they are helping their shop floors survive, that they're helping their families survive, they see other women doing the same thing. And this triggers a status inversion. First of all, it creates a blockade myth that the way to survive is to be active. So men who are weak and lying in bed are losing the will to live, therefore they are dying. It's actually more than that, but there's a myth of you must be active to stay alive and women cite this. We are trying to stay alive and help others by being active, but men are not. And by January, February of 1942, women are writing in their diaries or they're recalling years later that not only are women pulling their own weight, they are superior to men that this gendered socialization they have received is actually something that makes them stronger than men. They are truly the stronger sex. Here are three quotes among many. Let, let me give you the third one because it's, it's, it's one of my favorite. Um, women, quote, never were so helpless, never were such psychological dystrophics as men. I have never seen women begging for bread or ration cards. Men always begged for something, although rarely did anyone give them anything. Those who did not leave for the front or evacuate and had not yet died had a look of complete idiotism. Or artist Anna Astrovalyabadova, men are many times weaker than women in the struggle for life and resistance to death. The majority of men, if their wives are evacuated and they remain alone, if they had not taken different wives, which the elite sometimes do, very weakly resist difficulties of our life and die faster than women. So there's a status flip and women gain the sense of empowerment. Their labor, this gender division of labor is actually highly valued. And men notice this as well. Um, men will often comment that they are thankful that sisters, wives, daughters, mothers are going this extra mile for them. Mikhail Pelevin is one, he and his father live in separate abodes. His mother goes out every day to a job. She gets uh, extra food from the cafeteria, brings it back to him, and then goes to a separate apartment to take it to his father. She will go and stand in bread lines and do the same thing. She will bring water from the canals. So it's possible for them to bathe or to wash their rooms and their apartments. And when she finally, she does finally um, suffer from hunger and illness, she's in the hospital. He goes to visit her. She's pocketed some of her hospital ration, which she takes and gives to him and which he, she officially accepts. Or Liv Kogan, another worker, writes in March 1942 that his wife, and this is one time of several, one time went out to get some diluted port, came back home, went back out for cigarettes, and stood for two hours in the cold trying to find cigarettes. So smoke, it reduces the hunger pains. And then she would run out again. And finally, he realizes 
If she would lose her strength, we will all be lost, a recognition of dependency. There are men who also in recognizing this understand intuitively that the gender flip is a threat to them. And sometimes the same men will in one paragraph of a diary be thankful towards sisters, wives, and in the next paragraph will berate them. They'll become hypercritical as a way of bringing down that sense of status empowerment and of re-equilibrating. So one person who was an architect, thankful to his sister, would then accuse her more than once of stealing some food, of eating more than her fair share. Um, one worker, Piotr Samarin, happy that his wife is bringing home extra food from the cafeteria, would then yell at her for being naive, for wanting to argue with him all of the time, perhaps for hiding food or giving some to, his, to her mother so that maybe they're hoping he'll die of starvation, et cetera, et cetera. So men get this. And oftentimes they push back, um, especially men whose wives, some men whose wives have evacuated become very suspicious um, and become quite misogynist at points in their diaries as well. The Bolsheviks also figure out that women are doing an amazing job, putting an amazing effort, keeping the city alive. And number two, Bolshevik Alexei Kuznetsov in May 1942, berates the, his party colleagues for not recruiting women into the party. Uh, the amount of effort, the talents they've had at survival, this is exactly what the Bolshevik party needs. Um, so here's this quote where he's telling, uh, where he, at one meeting, he's, he's essentially telling his underlings, go out and recruit women. Um, women are organizations, women are networks of social provision and food, women are in trade. As he says, women have become a divisive force. Why have they been ignored all of this time? While well, women realize that they are putting in these superhuman efforts, while well, they sense this, this, this shift in status, they don't question the nature of gender at the same time. This is women's work, and they accept being caregiver, bread seeker, keeping the city alive. One example, again, of many, um, um, Olga Epstein, she's a single mother because her husband has gone to the front. He'll go missing in action early in the war. Misha is his name. She has a one-year-old son, Edik, um, who's also going to suffer. He's at nurseries for weeks on end so she can work. Um, she's also a Stakhanovite, um, and, and she's in the party, and um, she's, she and her husband are Jewish, and there's very interesting ethnic dynamics that, that go on in there. I can talk about that later if one wants. Um, she does all of this work at the factory and at home, and the two anchors of her narrative are her missing husband and her son. She also doesn't see for weeks on end. She's constantly referring back to them, pining for them. And even though she's doing the superhuman effort, she brings herself down in terms of status for them not being there. Here's just one quote again of many. Why do I, a mother, not have the chance to be with my own child? Somehow he is supposed to be with strangers. Again, Olga, you are like a, wolf, a lone wolf. One of the many times she beats herself up over not having her child nearby when she needs them when she needs him there. And even in the 1970s, women would tell Daniel Granin, the, the, the noted um, Soviet author, who was collecting information for a book on the blockade, women would come forward and say, look, this is why we did what we did. And they don't question the gender order. For them, this was natural. This was normal. And they were, by being women as they understood it, they were helping the city survive. Two quotes, again, of several. I know many girls, now grandmothers, who were active in the Komsomol at the time. They can tell you quite a bit. They were ordinary, usual factory girls when it was necessary. Such abilities and strength that no one suspected opened inside them. We never thought at all about ourselves, but thought about people and deeds they were charged to. Or the majority of people in blockaded Leningrad survived because they had to care, they had to care for someone. That sense of investment in others. How true that was. Only now I understand what saved me. Caring for children helped me save myself and then children. Did I have the right to lose my spirits and think only of myself? The takeaway from this is that this gendered habitus, bread-seeking, caregiving skills and practices are part of a virtuous or vicious circle, depending on one's perspective. And that is this, that the sense of gendered self led women to rise to the occasion to put in the efforts and to apply their skills to save others. They see that this is a valued, incredibly valued effort, raises their status, sense of self-worth. But this in turn, as I hope these last, uh, these last quotes start to show, this makes gender even more essentialist. It re-entrenches, further reinforces the sense that gender is not socially constructed, but rather is part of life. It becomes accepted, which then leads them to keep putting in this effort. And can contrast this with what happens after the American Civil War in, in Virginia, for example, or World War II, where there is much less risk, much less duress, 
where in fact women working in factories begins this embryonic shift towards rethinking the gender order, not just gender status. Here, in, on the other hand, it reinforces it. And I suspect the degree of risk has something to do with that. Questioning the gender order would mean adding even more uncertainty to what's already an uncertain situation. At least that's an hypothesis I've got in this. Now, this is a happy story of sorts because I'm talking about survival of people helping others. Part of the story of the blockade is the story of death. Um, easily more, the official figures are over 600,000 at the Nuremberg trials. Some Soviet historians said 800,000. When you start to factor in that the method for counting was, was problematic, when you factor in deaths during and right after evacuations, this could easily be a million people out of 2.5 million civilians who died. This Karyovskia Memorial Cemetery has, I've lost count of the number of trenches, mass graves, where there are more than 500,000 people at one cemetery. This is a smaller mass cemetery that personally I think is more authentic. It's not propagandized as some others are. Um, but this is the other half of the blockade. There's survival and suffering, but there's also suffering and death. More civilians will die here than there will be military deaths in the entire American Civil War in one city. Death is everywhere. Just as children and mates were anchors of valence that led women to go through these extraordinary efforts to encourage survival, the dead are another anchor of valence. And they literally cry out to the living to do something because they are everywhere. They are in courtyards, they are in sheds, they are on the streets. And the, the worst, one of the worst visions, and people will write about this, is walking by the dead. Not only the increasing number frozen in December, January, December 41, January, February 42, but that the flesh will start to disappear from the corpses. What to do with the dead? Um, I cannot even begin to imagine the trauma that, that this would lead. What to do with the dead will depend upon how people relate to the dead, and this will depend upon the field, the social field, the field of power, the field of labor, or the field of intimacy in which they sit and how they relate to the dead. Now, just kind of revisit this really quickly. I'll tell the this, this, this story in terms of these three positions that shape how the dead are perceived and then addressed in the field of power. The elite and, and, and subordinates immediately below them, the dead are inanimate matter, but they are a threat. They might be everywhere in the winter of 41, 42, so long as they're frozen, okay, but the winter will end and the dead will decay. And the threat of an epidemic um, is sitting in the minds of those in Smolny, the headquarters for, for the Bolsheviks. The fact that there are so many dead is also an aesthetic threat. It's a threat to Bolshevik aesthetics, and it might lead people to believe that maybe the Bolsheviks aren't in control of the city. Um, and it's, it's, it's a violation of Bolshevik discipline as well. So in fields of power, the dead are inanimate, they're just matter, but they're a potential threat. They have to be found, they have to be disposed of expediently. This, of course, means figuring out how many dead need to be collected. And in December 1941, as the wave of mass death is starting to break on the city, the elite don't know how many dead there are. It's only in the end of December 1941 that the chief of police issues an order that all morgues and hospitals at the end of every day are to report the number of dead who have come in or who have left. So the record keeping is problematic to begin with. But where are the dead as well? Some on the streets, some in sheds, some under snow. Maybe some are in cold rooms. They haven't been taken to cemeteries. So Jan December 41, January 42, the state kicks in trying to mobilize soldiers, workers from factories that are shut down, the Komsomol, to go out and find the dead, collect them, bring them to cemeteries, do something with them. The second field, the field of labor, the market economy of gain, these are especially grave diggers, those who have to collect the dead and dispose of them. And what we'll see in a second is they are going to see the dead as an object for gain a commodification of the dead body. Now, this might sound gruesome. This might sound as if grave diggers are jerks. However, disposing of the dead is extraordinarily difficult labor. The ground is frozen. There are not enough shovels. Forget finding gasoline so that you can have a backhoe or something to dig. You are dealing with corpses without special soap, gloves, special clothing. So this is a gruesome enough job as it is for workers who are weak from hunger in the cold, 
this is, I wouldn't even want to think about doing this myself. <laughs> okay. I, I, you push yourself to imagine this sometimes in the name of scholarship and then have to pull back. So it kind of makes sense that if one is going to go the extra effort to deal with the dead, they'll need to be bribed to do so. And in fact, the state cannot simply order workers um, from factories, go and dig the dead because they'll simply, and they will, they, they, they stay home and say, I'm sorry, I'm too hungry. So extra rations, extra money have to be provided, a bribe of sorts. Of course, they're also going to demand remuneration from civilians when they bring their dead to cemeteries, which leads to the third field, field of intimacy. If for the elite, the dead are a threat, if for these grave diggers especially, and their bosses, um, the dead are a possible source of a remuneration. Um, for family, kith, and kin, the dead are an other that had some intrinsic worth and who deserve something more than simply being thrown into the ground. They deserve some kind of respect, which will lead to a contradiction. Mm -hmm. Expending the effort, expending the resources to bury the dead, mm -hmm. that's resources that can be used on survival. Pragmatism versus meaning will come to haunt Leningraders especially when it is it comes to dealing with the dead. Now, these are three different fields, three different ways of looking at the dead, and they interact. You've got the elite ordering workers, police, some soldiers to collect and bury the dead. So what, do, what happens in response? An attempt to use the rules to make extra money. And this can take very many forms. One is dead souls. Gogol is still alive and well. And in fact, documents use the word dead souls. How does this work? Um, your, your, your work details are, you know, they, they'll bring in truckloads of dead and the documentation will say, say 200 dead. They'll get paid for 200. The police will check the back and realize, oh, there's only 150. So kind of gaming the system to get extra money with literally dead souls. Burial Trust, the cooperative that's charged with collecting the dead will demand bribes to take corpses from various housing complexes or from people who want extra benefit for their loved ones, money, food, vodka, or in one case, cows. I have no idea where the cows came from, but this is what the investigation said. They actually got cows from somebody. So there's all this opportunism going on below. The NKBD does not like this because this is autonomy. This is um, violating disciplinary norms. Um, and NKVD, and NKV in, in inspections of grave sites and this whole process reveal not only this kind of opportunism, but also bad aesthetics. Like one constant complaint is at, at these mass grave sites that corpses are strewn hither and thither and they're visible to civilians on the street. That they're not being piled properly in the trenches, not enough lime is being used, not enough dirt is being used. Sometimes trenches have to, corpses have to be taken out and put back in. So there's this tug of war of sorts going on between those who give the orders and those who do the work perfection and aesthetics and discipline from above, trying to get by from below. The NKVD raises some prosecutions, there's some repression now and then, but not very much. In a sense, there becomes this equilibrium of sorts where the aesthetics are never quite achieved, but in the end, the bodies do get buried. Imperfection seen from the field of power, awful work from below, but it's an extreme, it's an interesting resilience and the job does get done. Um, Fields of labor versus those who are bereaved. In the vast majority of cases, civilians did not have the energy to do much with the dead. Take them to courtyards, take them to sheds, um, and do not much more with them, which would haunt them. Those who might have enough drive and enough energy would make coffins and then drag the dead on sleds or maybe pay someone to drag them on sleds to a cemetery. This will get worse and worse, by the way, eventually using wood for firewood, people will take uh, the dead wrapped in linen on sleds, which will lead many Leningraders to reflect in their diaries how awful it is, um, the dead without coffins. But when you get them to the cemetery, then what? You can just leave them and then what will happen? They'll probably just be thrown into mass graves without respect. So here are some of the prices that grave diggers would demand for some respect to the dead. You can dig an individual grave. And, those, and there are some Leningraders who had somehow had the money and the food to bribe cemetery workers to do this. So six to 700 rubles, a kilo of bread and 250 rubles, a few hundred rubles and a liter and a half of vodka. Or to place a body properly in a mass grave right then and there in front of the bereaving civilians, just so they can see some honor was done to a father or a brother. Well, that costs 300 rubles plus a loaf of bread. Promising not to place one's father, and this is straight from a diary, 
promising not to place one's father in a water-filled grave strewn with frogs, one loaf of bread. So just basic dignity paying to do this. And this creates a tension of sorts between civilians and grave diggers. And civilians remark on this, um, sometimes with shock, sometimes with disgust. But at the same time, again, resilience is achieved in a negotiation between the two. This is, in a sense, this commodification is a denigration, but at least you're getting the service that you want, and that is some modicum of respect for the dead. The market can do what socialist command economy cannot. It can provide at least a little bit of respect. And so while civilians don't like this commodification, they'll play along with it because it is that better than nothing. In the state versus civilians, I'm getting close to the end here, in state versus civilians, less of a tension here, um, except in one moment. Um, one survival strategy is when someone is dead is to place them in a cold room so the corpse doesn't decompose, so that you can keep using the dead person's ration cards. Um, so as to you know, rationalize, optimize um, rations for the civilian population, you don't want to give food to the dead. So eventually the state will require the, re the periodic re-registration of ration cards so that people cannot use dead souls to get extra rations. Um, this does have an effect on the civilians living with the dead time and time again. Um, Ed Keenan at Harvard um, once told me that his first encounter with, with Russian political culture, as he talked about it, was he, he was over there as an exchange student in 1960 or 59, I believe. And he was dating a Russian woman, and she told this story, um, how she had grown up with this. And that always led him to think, well, what does this have to say about Russian Soviet political culture, this kind of trauma and suffering that seems to be buried deep in its cultural DNA. Um, and here are just a few quotes about how this did affect the sense of self. Um, I'll just read the second one. A shack was there, and some women, some woman was singing and giving out death certificates. I signed the death certificate. She brought her loved one there and said, where should I bury my daughter? There over there. And there were soldiers. I brought over my little girl and looked around. They were throwing them, throwing them or taking them straight to the truck and throwing them into the truck which should be taken away for disposal. They told me, put her there at the edge. I put her there. I then asked carefully, and what is this just for today? The soldier looked at me. Don't be naive, young person. It happens all the time. And it's the last line of the first quote, um, which is a, it's a story of civilians actually helping load a truck with the dead. When we returned home in the evening, we could not drink or eat. Not the only examples of this either. Um, so different fields, different responses to the dead, different ways of relating to them, and therefore different strategies. And sometimes come into conflict, but interestingly, they do come together to deal with the dead. The epidemic never occurs. And there's one interesting coda to this, that civilians reflect upon how the state treats the dead, on how grave diggers treat the dead, and how they themselves treat the dead. Not only taking them and dropping them off at cemeteries, not giving them the last rights they should, but walking over them nonchalantly on the street. It seems to an external observer that this is just dehumanization, this is numbness. And some historians, American historians of the blockade have remarked about this. Oh, Leningraders are becoming numb. But the reality is they go back into their diaries and they write with remorse about doing this. They are compelled to be pragmatic, but they do not want to be. This is similar to James C. Scott's hidden transcript. That is, this is the moment that keeps alive some degree of agency and some spark of humanity. That while they have to treat the dead in a pragmatic fashion, the fact that they don't want to keeps alive the importance of dignity and the human spirit in this moment of survival. In a sense, being pragmatic can create a conscience and no more so than the moment of death. So two stories, and I'm just going to scratch the surface on them. What do we learn about the blockade? First, inequality persists. It shapes survival strategies, as well as the degree of suffering that one feels. And in the end, gendered and class-based survival contribute to a reproduction of the sense that inequality, even in the socialist system, is inevitable, is natural. Death and disposal, different rationalities. Um, they compel pragmatism and that can paradoxically lead to resilience, even though there's contradictions in the way these different folks approach the dead. Other things, shadow markets of so stealing food from the state, a black market arises in parallel to a formal ration economy. Um, this leads to a, de a decline in state capacity, a decline in state dependency power, but in allowing 
insider thieves and opportunists and civilians to trade with each other, allowing the masses to sort things out, there is a wisdom of the crowd. Again, it's almost as if markets and hierarchies together figure out some way of resilience at this moment. Um, the Odyssey, you started to see some of the, of the sites, there are many more where Leningraders reflect upon what are sources of suffering and what are communities of authentic suffering. The Red Army, Leningrad, more than Moscow, but maybe there are those who don't suffer authentically, like, I don't know, the Communist Party. My sense from reading diaries is that Stalin and the party lose resonance in the blockade, but a sense of nation, the army, and an odd sort of way, the state do come through with some degree of resonance. Beyond the blockade, there are lessons um, from this moment that social distance matters. Um, I can talk a little bit about, a little more about this you know, whenever anyone wants, but um, symbolic and social distance shape how we decide to interact with others. It's a very quick example, it becomes easier um, to eat horses than humans because a horse is closer to a cow, but a human being is further apart. And this actually reduces um, the number, uh, the potential for cannibalism um, in the city. The amount of cannibalism is lesser than one would expect, and this is part of the reason. Humans are just too symbolically distant from what's considered normal food. Now, resilience involves these complexities that seem to involve kind of a, with a retreat from control. That is a devolution of, of authority from elites to lower institutional levels, even to average people. This allows local knowledge and innovation to break through to help survival, but also seems to create a sense of alignment. That is, again, markets versus hierarchies. When there's a devolution of agency, it can create the sense that everyone's on the same page at the same time. And this is something I'm exploring a little more in the sequel to this, which is um, uh, in, in, in the works right now. And of course, um, the story of the blockade calls out for more um, very studies, not only in Leningrad, but Kiev, um, Smolensk occupied during the war, frontline cities, cities behind the lines. That is, we need more comparisons of different experiences of suffering. And then putting the Holocaust, the blockade, Sarajevo, and the American Civil War into some kind of comparison because we need to understand how it is that we suffer and how it is that we survive. The blockade has provided some insights, but this is only just the beginning and there's a lot more work to be done. Thank you. Um, sorry, I've gone over a little bit, but um, I, thank you. Any questions, comments, I am more than willing to. Of course, uh, hope, has to, I hope has to have her moment. So let me move the chair and move this a little bit. Oh, don't worry. <laughs> Well, um, it's an honor to be here. Um, this, you know, thank you for your passionate presentation. And that passion is visible in the manuscript as well. Um, such a, um, the, the capacity to sort of put both passion and scholarship into a book is is not something everyone can do and you've really done that so you. you know thank you so much um i remember my first trip to the soviet union um was in 1987 studying for the summer in leningrad what's now saint petersburg mm -hmm. and uh, as everyone, we were taken to the main cemetery that you didn't show, um, Piskorevskaya um, Cemetery. Oh, yeah, there it is. Um, and, you know, you talked about the propaganda. They had this sort of, you know, funereal music playing over loudspeakers, which, you know, was sort of unnecessary, but... Um, but I will never forget walking and walking and walking and still being in 1942 and seeing these mass graves with, you know, one year, um, a stone tablet showing the year and just walking and walking in 1942 never ended. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so it, it, it was, um, a really powerful experience and and you know they have found a way to 
really honor that. Um, and you have found a very different, a much more complete way of honoring um, what what Lenin Gratters went through. Um, of course, reading this and thinking about this topic right now of wartime suffering, you know, one cannot help but think about the Ukrainians. Mm -hmm. Um, with sort of every page of this book, you know, you're also thinking, I mean, in, in, in your book, the, the Soviets, Russians, Ukrainians, and others, the Soviets were the victims, you know, whereas right now it's, um, they uh, are Russians waging war on Ukraine. And, you know, we're all wondering how, how do people survive um, in, in, this, these terrible circumstances. Um, I was very interested when you mentioned from looking at the diaries that you see less about Stalin and um, sort of the, the government or the, the leaders as a whole. And that of course was a key strategy that developed during the course of World War II, when Stalin and the others immediately said, like, we need everybody on board, whatever it takes. So yeah, go visit the church, you know, <laughs> go engage in whatever barter economy you need to, um, um, you know, whatever national groups that we maybe had discriminated against before, you know, we're not now, we have one external enemy, mm -hmm. the Nazis, and so we're uniting against that. So that's one thing that you sort of answered. I don't know if you have anything more to mm -hmm. say about that, but, you know, how much you saw um, that reflected uh, in the diaries, that there was this change um, also reading this, I couldn't help but think of Evgenia Ginsburg's um, mm -hmm. memoir, um, Journey into the Whirlwind and Within the Whirlwind, another story of suffering in the Soviet Gulag and how do you survive? Yeah. Um, and who do you blame? Now, in this case, it was, in your case, it's much easier, you know, we're being attacked mm -hmm. by the Germans. <laughs> Um, um, couldn't do that uh, with with the gulag, um, but still there, you know, there um, there were people also being sent to the gulag as as this was going on. So um, so I'll I'll leave it at that for right now and see if you have any response um, about Stalin and and. His um, withdrawal or compromise, I, mean, I can never quite figure out what the best word is for that. Um, he is trying to, yes, he is trying to encourage more of a sense of solidarity as well as hierarchy. Um, although the attempt to maintain control at the Leningrad level is still there. This is the fascinating thing is like when the black markets start to emerge, when there's theft from food depots and sales in the, um, in the Rinex system. Um, when that really starts picking up steam, Zhanov and Kuznetsov um, instruct the NKVD and the police to start investigating, clamp down as much as possible. So that kind of repress, mm -hmm. that instinct is still there. Mm -hmm. um, actually, we step back for a moment. What should have been clear in 1941 is food security. That that's going to be a big threat, especially when the, the Wehrmacht is getting awfully close to the city, because they know we don't have enough food storage. Mm -hmm. Um, so not only do they kind of mess up the ration routine at the beginning, even before the Germans surround the city, September, October, getting into November, the number one threat was um, anti-Soviet counter-revolutionary forces, the spy mania, rather than maybe we should be trying to figure out where the food is now and do something about it. They're still looking for this internal enemy. And it's only around late November that in, within the NKVD, you start to see the shift. Mm -hmm. This The light bulb starts to go on that okay, maybe the real threat isn't our own people. And one fascinating show of this is um, the NKVD Svodki, the reports of overhearing conversations, less and less and less will use anti-Soviet or counter-revolutionary, um, except in the case of wanting to surrender the city. <laughs> um, that's the one time it persists. 
So they're getting a little bit less repressive. So Stalin might be wanting to create this hierarchy, but the folks below have they gotten the message yet? They don't until it's a little bit too late. And they're compelled to actually start negotiating, as it were, kind of wink, wink, nudge, nudge, negotiating in the breach with shadow markets, shadow practices, mm -hmm. um, whether it's shadow exchange or the rumor mill, that kind of thing. But in the diaries, it's fascinating. Stalin does come up with his July 41 speech. When he, after like taking his little hiatus, he addresses the nation and people catch on to hear him drinking water. So that, that one moment humanizes him. He sounds human. He sounds like one of us. He sounds nervous. So that kind of humanizes him, softens him to an extent. Mm. And cadres in the in state documents will keep referring to Stalin. We have to do things for Stalin. And there is the occasional Leningrader. Um, I can think of one in particular. She's um, in the party and she is um, running this project of, of collecting materials for party history. And she refers back to the party to Stalin as these beloved entities and figures. But for everyone else, he kind of just drops off the radar. Um, some people will talk about his November 41 speech. So it'll be the occasional refer reference to him, although it's big news. So there it's, he's, Stalin's in the news, so let's bring him up as we refer to the news. But he disappears from everyday life. Yeah. And his everyday life is what these people are reflecting on. And Stalin is not what they're defending. They're defending close others, kith and kin. They're defending the city. They identify with the city, which, you know, as you remember, 19, 1987 and afterward is a city worth defending. Definitely. Beautiful, beautiful city. city. Uh, and they're defending this Soviet civilization. They want to defend mm -hmm. civilization. Mm -hmm. This is something that comes up in writing about um, uh, cannibalism, for example. That, that if cannibalism really is this widespread, this is the end of our sense of humanity and the end of Soviet civilization. Mm -hmm. So, and I think this, this is, I kind of propose this link that this has got to do with suffering. There's something about authentic suffering and we see the Red Army is obviously they're suffering, they're fighting for us at the front. If we're being bombed, imagine what they are getting. And soldiers will come back from the front on occasion on leave to talk about what's happening. They see each other suffering. And so this is the real backbone of Soviet civilization. So those who are suffering for the cause and the cause isn't Stalin. The cause is the, um, this new, to riff on Steve Kotkin, this is this alternative civilization. And there's almost the sense of ownership. It's ours because we're the ones who are putting blood and energy into it um, on the everyday level. So he is kind of withdrawing a bit from the, from the agate prop, but they're not paying much attention to the agate prop yeah. to begin with. Yeah. They've got other more important yeah, other things. Important things. Um, and now uh, to the, uh, the question of the gulag. The gulag, yes, the gulag in the Holocaust as other cases, how does all of this, did the same dynamics work out? I didn't look at the gulag that much. Um, other, otherwise, that was, a, I could have made this totally comparative and I'd still be working on it. Yeah. Um, Svetan Todorov had written something interesting on the gulag survival strategies that um, both in the, death, the German death camps and, and in the Stalinist gulags, these um, attempts at survival could sometimes be very homo economic, steal someone, others, someone else's bread. But there was a lot of attempt to humanize each other. Something as simple as um, washing from the latrine, which sounds awful in our moment of plenty, our, you know, our first world problems that face us every day. But that was actually, you know, you're trying to keep clean to some extent. That moment, those little moments of, of, of humanity that these people struggled to, to, to keep with. Um, I'm trying to reflect back to Ginsburg, but I, there, I can't remember the specifics, but there are, are always those moments. Yeah. yeah. And when you know, the tapping on the wall, yeah. um, when she's in, in, in the big house. And helping each and other with helping rations. Helping each other with too. rations. Um, mm -hmm. So there's something about the suffering and the sol mm -hmm. solidarity that come together. Um, I'm not, you know, this is not anything unique on my part, but there's something about suffering and empathy and solidarity. Mm -hmm. um, there, there's some interaction between the two. Um, that you see in many of these awful cases yeah. that you know, I, I kind of wondered about COVID. Is this, is this going to kick in during COVID? Mm -hmm. I was hopeful at the start that maybe mm -hmm. our sense of humanity can, can emerge in all of this. Maybe, maybe there's a threshold of visible suffering that one has to pass. Mm -hmm. I'd have to contact the cognitive psychologist <laughs> for a little help on measuring that one. <laughs> so I think, um, you know, we, 
I, I think we were supposed to end it too, but I would propose we, well, we take some questions. Go, go for a few, you know, yeah. take some questions from those in the room and those. Are there uh, questions online now? No? Well, please, uh, those who are online, if you can hear me and you have questions, please put them in the chat. And anybody here? Yeah. Um, I, I, I wanted to ask something about um, if you saw any evidence in the documents that you would have for I don't I have two 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 related self sacrifice or triage in the sense of for instance who um, uh, among the dead for instance if you knew anything about whether for instance let's say this is hypothetical um, elderly people self sacrifice gave their rations up for you know their descendants or anything like that or whether um maybe uh family members got together and said let's you know grandma and gave it once that kind of thing i'm not phrasing it very no I, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. um um yes uh You could extrapolate this to a, a gruesome logical conclu conclusion, which does need to be considered, but um, self-sacrifice, yes. There are examples of that. Fathers, um, for example, the fathers have a very hard time finding food, collecting and doing something with it. They just don't know how to do it. One thing that um, the nicer fathers, the less egoistic fathers will do is they'll give some of their rations to their kids. Um, this does happen, and there's one case, um, I'm forgetting the surname at the moment, where his wife actually yells at him, don't sacrifice so much for the kids, because right now you're still able to go to work, which means money, additional rations you can bring back home. If you die sacrificing for your kids, we're going to be in even worse shape. So there are those moments where parents will give extra rations, grandparents will give extra rations. Um, and sometimes that is going to lead them to a quicker death than otherwise might have been the case. Um, I have not found in diaries, but I've heard stories um, from friends, parents who are blockade children of um, a very good friend of mine. In fact, his mother tells the story that um, the father gave his ration cards and said, just keep taking them, keep eating the food and stop feeding them. So while I'm alive, keep collecting because he knew he was going to die. Um, so there are those moments as well where people know I'm going to go just keep collecting the rations and I'll just you know, find a cold room or somewhere for me where this will be as painless as possible. Um, that does happen, yes. And people are sharing food all the time anyhow, which in a moment of scarcity is sacrifice. It's not like you're giving the extra slice of bread that you got from dinner in the cafeteria. This is these are calories you're giving up. So there's a lot of that that goes on all around. But yes, parents giving for the kids, grandmothers, fathers still alive giving for the kids. Yes, that does happen. Um, offing people to get their ration cards is more likely with strangers. Um, you do have the occasional moment when a hungry teen takes the ration cards off to the store and doesn't come back with enough food. That happens every now and then. Um, more likely, though, is uh, stealing from strangers. And when Leningraders would talk in their diaries or relate someone else's story about being mugged and losing one's ration cards, it's the, the prose becomes funereal. It's a moment of mourning because this might be um, your 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 death ticket. Um, one moment, in fact. It, and this was the one I tried, this is, you try to be brave. This is the one time I, I broke down doing all this work. There was a teenager's diary. And the last four sentences, two were illegible, but the two that were illegible were, illegible were mother and I are dying, our ration cards were stolen. That's it, end of diary. Um, so there were those who would pilch your fat ration cards or steal food from others. In fact, there were some desperate, it was always, almost always males, Desperate, they would just come into these bread lines. Someone would get their bread, they'd steal the bread and then eat it right in front of everybody else. That's how desperate they were. At which point the, the, the line would usually spontaneously just beat the living daylights out, the, out of them, I think in one case to death. Um, so killing others to get their food, yes, there were opportunists that would do this, but not 
not within. It was sacrifice was one thing, but killing one's other. Um, that one, it's really, it's really rare, and it's never a direct report. It's always a police report or a third hand story that comes up in diaries. So I'm sure it happened, but it's that kind of thing is kind of rare. Killing strangers, different story because you don't know who they are, they're a target for opportunism. But somehow seeing people up close suffering, it just, it makes it difficult to kill, even in desperate situations. Um, yeah, I mean, there's, now I, I said something about, um, you could take this kind of strategic thinking to its ultimate conclusion. And if you wanted to help Leningrad survive, um, Cannibalism was looked upon very negatively. This was the end of civilization. What's to stop the regime, though, from a Leningrad version of Soylent Green? And searching the documents, talking to as many scholars as I can, what's interesting is that's never even considered. It doesn't even go near the radar. So there are some things that are just unmentionable. Even if, and there's one, there's one Leningrader who mentions, look, cannibalism is rational. That's how you survive. It's, it's an inanimate object. It's protein. But for the most part, it's that's just beyond the pale, even if that would save people. So there are these interesting limits. Sacrifice, I'm doing it myself. It's, it's my call. But taking from someone else, only if they're a stranger, and even then, there are these Rubicons that rarely get crossed. And in terms of cannibalism, the thought, the, the suspicion is those are refugees who are doing that because refugees didn't have ration cards. So that was, that was, you know, that you, it was the worst category of all in terms of, of survival. Other questions? Yes, please. Yeah. So reading about and writing this must have been extremely emotionally taxing. Like, how do you like keep a good, a good emotional distance where you can take care of yourself, but not so far that you don't do justice to the suffering that happened? I don't have a formula that I can give you. Um, I don't know, it's a question to ask myself. I mean, I, there were moments I could just kind of get into this zone of, okay, I've got the stories and let me tell the stories and let me figure out what's going on and then just kind of wait. And then uh, the crash would hit. Um, that would sometimes be days later, months later, depending on how things were working. Um, it did help that amidst all the suffering, we're still all these glimpses of, of humanity and heroism. So you know, there was this kind of sense of shame. It's like, look, if they put up with it, mm -hmm. I can certainly keep up the brave face and, and on the one hand, inquire the way a scholar should. Um, not buy into myths, not buy into propaganda. What's the story there? That doesn't mean being skeptical about what Leningraders wrote. Um, you know, take them at their word, and if something doesn't seem to fit, then kind of reflect upon, see what's going on. Um, but, you know, kind of, if they could do it, I owe it to them to tell the story. And then, of course, yes, inevitably the crash happens, and I think it happened right after the book came out. <laughs> um, I have been feeling a little bit tired since then, so it, it, it was a hard normal, balance. Though, too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, um, and with COVID and everything else, so, I mean, a bunch of things feeding it. But it was a very, it, it was hard. And I just had to keep reminding myself. It's like, look, we owe it to um, these people, to people, and not only just the Leningraders who suffered, but to everyone who has. So, you know, someone's got to be, I don't know, brave, dumb, foolhardy enough to do it. Might as well be me. But it was hard. It, I don't know how I balanced it. I, I, it's, you just kind of do as you go along, like, like Leningraders did. Anybody else or anyone online? Anyone online? So, um, well, I have lots and lots okay. of questions, <laughs> but, you know, obviously I can do this offline. I mean, one, I, I, I do like just to keep, keep the response going and this will, you know, obviously I'll, I'll be the last and say goodbye to everyone. But, um, you know, one of the things I thought was kind of interesting, I mean, the men who are, who are starving and so weak, I mean, they, they aren't in the army. So they may have already been predisposed to, to um, I don't know, weakness, you might call it. 
Um, I don't know if that's the case, but it might have been <coughs> selected. The right. gender story might have been self-selected. Um, and when they berate women, I mean, in a sense, it's also because they're not in the army, it's really the shame of yeah. not participating in the in, in, in the army that might also be at work. Like that they it's it's not so much that the women are being berated for not being good women, but that they themselves feel feel that um, they're not living up to their own sense of self. So that so I wasn't sure if it was really status reversal. It was just the gender analysis, just to raise a few questions about that. Um, and then on the question about social distance, and I'm now I'm commenting as a sociologist, you guys have to <laughs> forgive me, but, but, but you know, on the social uh, distance um, story. Um, so what kept it coming back to me when I was reading the book was the, was the parallels that you saw in concentration camps uh, mm -hmm. during the same period. And um, stories about sacrifice, but also opportunism and, mm -hmm. and people who were in effect forced into cleaning latrines and burying people and taking them out of gas chambers. And, you know, you read all those terrible stories from the Holocaust. Um, and it reminded me a lot, your story um, of the role of emotion and people who are close to you was, um, of course, the famous Viktor Frankl yes. story. Mm -hmm of what kept him going through, through the concentration camp horrors was just, just the memory of a loved one. Um, so if, the, if a memory of the loved one can motivate people to get through dehumanizing experiences, um, har you know, har real horrors, one can imagine if you have a family member with you, the kind of... So, he was a man, he wasn't a woman, right. you know, it wasn't about women's mm -hmm. roles per se, mm -hmm. it's it, maybe it's more about human empathy more generally that came across. But, you know, beyond that, I, I, I find more and more rich, richness coming out of this, these stories that that you tell us. And of course, um, one can't but help but think about at the moment, Ukrainians who are under siege <laughs> also in, in many cities and, um, you know, under bombardment, living in basements for, for months and, and so on. Um, so that, you know, the, the, the universal humanism of your story really, um, it continues, I think, to resonate in contemporary times. So thank you so much for the manuscript. Thank you so much, Hope, for your um, commentary. And um, please feel free to reach out to the author yep. um, if you uh, want to hear more. Yep. Uh, just send us an email um, or put your name in the chat and um, we'll connect mm -hmm. you with, with uh, Jeff. So thanks again. Well, thank you all. Thank you.